This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. So what do you know about this? Do you know you're the last ones that are going to be doing the paper? This paper, Professional Accountant, is no longer going to exist after this sitting. This is it. No more Professional Accountant after this. Changing syllabus? Changing? Syllabus? No, well, I suppose a little bit, yeah. Not much. But it's not going to be called Professional Accountant. It's going to be called uh, Governance, Ethics and Risk. All right, so you're the last ones. And I can see you telling your grandchildren in years to come and saying I was, an, I was one of the last ones to do a professional accountant paper. Your examiner is a man called David Campbell. David Campbell. Um, it's on page... It's on the second page. After ends and objectives, it's at the bottom of the, uh, the second page. The examiner, David Campbell... And he does write articles. I've not checked just recently, I have to admit, I've not checked just recently whether he's written any recent articles, but he did have a, a sudden rush of madness back in 2009, and he wrote four articles in four months, one January, February, March and April in 2009. And when he writes articles, he does ask about them, so keep your eyes open. And clearly on the revision course, I will make sure, as I know you will make sure, that uh, you're up to date with all his articles. The exam itself, question one, is compulsory. Of course it's compulsory, it's 50 marks. So you can't pass the paper without doing question one, but you can, you can do bits of question one rather than the whole of it. So although it's a compulsory question, although I say you therefore have to do it to pass, you can pass without. It will be unusual, it will be a bad mistake to attempt only part of the question, but it would be possible to pass P1 without attempting the whole of question 1. So question 1, 50 marks, it's normally broken down into subsidiary sections, so it's not all one 50 mark question. And in fact, if you look at the revision kit, towards the end of the revision kit, towards the end of the questions in the revision kit, you'll find, for instance, I'm on page 35, page 34, 35. Yeah, and page 32 and 33. You see that on page 33, part A1 is for 12 marks, part A2 is for 6, part B is 8 marks, part C is 14, part D 10 marks. So they're, they're broken down uh, into subsidiary questions. But they're long questions, obviously they're long questions, it's an hour and a half question. Part, section B, I'm sorry, section B of the paper is three questions, 25 each, and you do two of them. Two, marks, two questions, 25 marks each. I don't know whether I'm a simple person. Well, I think I am a simple person. But it does seem to me that there's a, quite a strong degree of repetition in the sort of questions that he asks and the sort of standard comments that you can make as part of your answers. Uh, and we will get used to seeing these standard elements of answers when we come back on the revision course. But today and tomorrow we've got to get through these notes. Um, I've tried to keep them interesting. When I first wrote them, they were awfully boring. Oh, really, really, really boring. But now they're just, just really boring. So they're not really, 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 just, just boring. It's not actually, it's quite an interesting topic. Um, particularly this fashionable element about corporate governance. Uh, it, and it is fashionable, it comes up throughout the ACCA syllabus, it comes up in right the early papers of F4, you'll find corporate governance in the, the law paper. And it, clearly it comes up in uh, F8, in the auditing paper, it comes up again now in P1, and in P2, and in P7, and those are just the papers I teach. So whether they come up also in, uh, in the other papers that the other tutors teach, I don't know. But it's a very fashionable topic, is corporate governance. And it became fashionable back in 1992. It became fashionable because of a number of high-profile corporate failures uh, in the UK. And the government asked a man called Sir Adrian Cadbury to try and identify what it was that was causing these high-profile corporate failures. 
and he came up in 1992 with his Cadbury report. And since then there have been a number of um, reports added on, things about directors, things about nominations, things about how companies should operate. Uh, and these have been added all together and they now combine into what's called the Combined Code in the UK. The Combined Code. And it's seen as a, as a good, inverted commas, it's seen as a good code, a good code of practice that companies should follow. The Americans have gone a different way. The Americans have put into law, there's no need to write any of this down, Agnesa, no need to write any of this down. It's all within the notes and we'll talk through it. The Americans have gone a different route and they said, instead of having a code of practice, a sort of general guidance, which is what we have in the UK and what is apparently generally accepted pretty much throughout Europe, if not the world, excluding America, the Americans have decided to go into a rules-based approach and they say these are the rules, this is the law and you will follow the law. And the piece of legislation in the States is called, you should know from work, it's called Sarbanes-Oxley, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, it was introduced by two senators, I think they were, or maybe congressmen, uh, Mr. Sarbanes or Mrs. Sarbanes and, and Oxley. And they came up with this Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and, and this it sets out the rules. And it's a clear definition, you, you do this and therefore you don't do that. Whereas the combined code, this general guidance that we have in the UK and which seems to be generally accepted, is more a set of principles. It's principles-based rather than rules-based. Uh, and it just establishes the general principles rather than being detailed and specific like Sarbanes-Oxley is. Now, it wouldn't be an unusual question for Campbell to ask and say, what are the advantages of a rules-based system compared with a, uh, a principles-based system? So we'll need to think about that, and we will be going through it. But that's the sort of thing he could very well ask. Okay? So, corporate governance, page one. This is a definition which Sir Adrian Cadbury uh, established, he said, corporate governance is a system by which organizations are directed and controlled. It's a set of relationships between the entity's directors, shareholders, therefore the company, and the other stakeholders. And it establishes why it is important that companies should follow these principles, and why it's not fair if they don't follow the principles, and why uh, if we do follow the principles, we should therefore be able to avoid high-profile corporate failures. And of course you can see how well this combined code is working, because there haven't been any high-profile corporate failures, have there, in the UK in the last few years? Have there been any high-profile corporate failures in the UK in the last few years? No? What do you do in the evening? You do not watch the BBC News. Of course, there have been hundreds of them. What's, what do you think this world crisis is, this world economic crisis? The banks losing all their money. One of the major banks being taken over by the government to protect it from folding, protect people's money. These high-profile corporate failures have not been stopped. The Americans with their Sarbanes-Oxley law, that stopped it, didn't they? There were no high-profile American failures, were there? Were there? Well, can you name any? Hmm? Lehman Brothers, yeah, Lehman Brothers, and Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, and the Montana Bank of something or other. Yeah, they have been. So, being the sort of cynical person that I am, I know you don't possibly think I'm a cynical person, but I am really. Being the cynical person that I am, I just keep having to ask myself, is this concept of corporate governance, rules-based or principles-based, is it working? Has it stopped it? Has it protected investors? Has it protected employees and stakeholders generally? And I think that you have to, to conclude and say, well, no it hasn't. It doesn't actually seem to have made any difference at all. There are still high-profile corporate failures. The other thing which I find intriguing, and which certainly some of you in the room should also find intriguing, is with all these high-profile corporate failures, Presumably, their financial statements had been audited by probably big four firms of auditors who have been presumably giving unqualified audit opinions on derivatives and financial instruments and all these exciting new documents and, and transactions that companies entered into. 
and then within, well, certainly within 12 months, the company's in liquidation because things were overvalued or speculative or were not worth as much as they were claimed to be worth. But the auditors have given these unqualified opinions. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. No, 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 far be it from me to select any of you. Um, but it, it does seem strange to me that the audit profession... Have you heard of any firms of auditors who have been, inverted commas, damaged at all by all these failures in, in the world? Deutsche companies and Norwegian and generally the continental companies. Have you heard of any auditors who have been sued for negligence? Have any auditors been named? Lehman Brothers has gone into liquidation, their auditors were blah blah. How, do you know the names of any of the auditors, other than generally, of any of the auditors specific to these companies? I don't. I've not heard a word about it. So I'm thinking that maybe the audit profession has escaped. Responsibility, liability, allegations of negligence, it looks to me like we could very well have escaped as auditors. So corporate governance, back to your notes, a set of relationships between, well, between everybody involved in the company. It says between entities, directors, shareholders and other stakeholders. Uh, who's involved in this, this heading of other stakeholders? It's not the directors, not the shareholders, because those are specifically named. But who's involved in being an other stakeholder? Are you yourselves, are you stakeholders in, for instance, your national telephone company? Yeah, you are. Well, because you use the national telephone company service. Are you stakeholders in the national telephone company of the country where I live? Are you stakeholders there? Indirectly. So you are therefore a stakeholder. Directly or indirectly, you're a stakeholder. What about the National Telephone Company of Uzbekistan? Should they be bearing in mind your interests in any transactions that they enter into? They should. Okay. What about Burkina Faso? It's a small country in Africa. Are you a stakeholder of the... Say again? Do they have their phones? Oh! Oh, yes, they do. You have to wind them up and say, hello, can I speak to the operator? Um, you are, funnily enough, your stakeholders there as well. And in fact, if you think about it, we're all of us stakeholders of every company, of every organisation, of every person. The things that you do affect me, because the things that you do affect the planet on which I live, and therefore I am affected. And John was talking to me this morning, he, he brought me in this morning, and he was saying, isn't it amazing, there was a, a box here been left by a student from yesterday's course, the F7 course, it's a calculator. How much did this calculator cost, do you think? What, what's the price of a calculator? Certainly when John was a child, which was a few years before I was a child, calculators didn't exist. He, he was the first one to have a calculator in the, the firm of accountants where he was employed. And he, he made his own, he bought a do-it-yourself, make-it-yourself kit and, and sat at home one evening and made himself a calculator. And then he took it into work the next day and put it on the desk and his colleague said, what's that? And he says, it's a calculator, watch this, boop, boop, boop. see it adds for numbers up and multiplies numbers together. Where did you get it? I made it, will you make me one? How much did this cost, do you think? Give me a wild guess. Three. Three? You're almost double. It's 172. He said, how can you possibly make a calculator? Probably in the Far East. I don't know. It probably says somewhere. There's certainly Chinese writing on it. Um, how can you possibly make a calculator and, and make a profit? Because you're probably making 50% profit on this. It's probably uh, cost maybe 80 cents to, to produce that. And we're disturbing and taking the Earth's resources to make calculators for next to nothing. And how can we do that when the, the paper, the cardboard itself, and the, and the bubble wrap inside, and the colour printing, and the crystals, and the dials, and the buttons, and the screen on the calculator, and it all costs less than, 50, less, less than 80 cents. How can you possibly do it? By paying the people who make them a tiny amount of money. John said this morning, he said, no wonder half the world's population is poor. 
I think it's probably a little more than half, but I'm not including you in there. How can you do that? Do you care? Ladies, come on, this is an interactive course. This is not just me talking and asking rhetorical questions. I need, I need some, some feedback from you. All right, so we're all stakeholders of everything. We're all of us stakeholders. And, and Campbell, David Campbell wrote this article back in probably January 2009. It said even the trees and the plants are stakeholders. In, in things, that, things that John does on his course. Even the trees and the plants and the birds and the, and the fish. And I quote Campbell in his article, he says, And even the as yet undiscovered creatures of the deep fish that we don't even know exist because we've never found any because they deep, live deep down maybe three kilometers deep even below BP in their oil well they, they live down in the bottom of the ocean and we've never seen any of them so we don't know that they exist well we do actually we know that they exist it's just we don't know what they are because we've never seen any but they are stakeholders they're stakeholders in this business school the stakeholders in John John's company produces these course notes BPP produced the books and they cut down the trees in order to make the books and the trees are part of the ecosystem and the environment and they generate and keep the planet alive and these poor fish down at the bottom of the ocean that nobody has ever seen they are affected by the BPP producing books it's amazing once you once you let your mind go once you get motivated and excited and, and emotional about the whole thing you suddenly realize that you have a responsibility not only to you yourselves and your immediate family but to generations who have yet to be born that's where your responsibilities are your responsibility is to keep this planet alive never mind trying to pass paper P1 corporate governance is an issue for all entities. It doesn't matter whether they're large quoted companies, whether they're commercial organizations, it doesn't matter if they're not for profit organizations, they're all affected by corporate governance. Management awareness elements, management awareness, evaluation, mitigation of risk. It includes the operation of an adequate and appropriate system of control. The number of times I'm going to say this next two days, an appropriate system or a sound system of internal control, if you paid me a dollar, I wouldn't need to come in tomorrow. I could, I could retire. Sound systems of internal controls, it's a really important element of corporate governance. Overall performance is improved by good supervision and management within set best practice guidelines. Where are you going to find the guidelines? Where will you find the guidelines for good management and good supervision? Yes, yes, certainly within the combined code. Or alternatively, if you were in America, you'd find them in Sarbanes-Oxley. Set, set, they wouldn't be set practice guidelines there, would they? They would be set practice rules. The framework for an organization to pursue strategy in an ethical and effective way is one of the elements of corporate governance. A framework for an organization to pursue its activities, its strategy, in an ethical and effective way. What do you understand by ethical? Ethics. What are ethics? Fairness. Fairness means yeah, fairness is in there, certainly. Fairness. Fairness for whom? Because if I'm fair to you, I may not be being fair to somebody else. Mm. We're gonna, we have to strike a balance. We have to determine a balance of fairness. What is fair for the greatest number of the greatest people? Um, so ethics is, ethics is behaving in an honest and upright and straightforward and trustworthy and transparent way. Ethics is, is doing the right thing. Not just because you're told to do the right thing, but you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's the honourable and trustworthy and fair thing to do. Uh, so ethical and effective way, this is for companies. How do companies operate in an ethical and effective way? 
Well, does, does a company act? Does a company enter into a transaction? Does a company make a phone call? Does a company sign a contract? Surely it's the people in charge of the company that are doing this. It's got to be done by people. Companies can't do it. You don't see companies walking down the street or catching the tram. So it's the people who are in charge of the company who are required to be acting in an ethical and effective way. The qu this note here says it's the framework for an organization to pursue a strategy in an ethical and effective way. But really it's providing guidance for those who are in charge of companies to operate in an, in an ethical and effective way. It offers safeguards against the misuse of resources. It doesn't matter whether those resources are human, financial, physical or intellectual resource, then they should be used carefully, they should be used responsibly. It involves more than following externally established codes of good practice. If you set up a code of good practice, you can follow it and you can be happy in the knowledge that you followed it. But if you're not willing to, to take that one step further, and code of good practice says you should act honestly and you, you shouldn't tell lies. Well, I can tell you all sorts of half-truths. They are truths, it's just that it's not necessarily the whole truth. And an example I use, but it is only an example, ladies, it is only an example, that ever since I've been coming to your city, I've never slept with a single woman. Not a single one. Slept with two or three, but never a single one. I've never slept with a single one. I slept with married women. I've never slept with married women. I slept with two married women. Or I didn't go to sleep. I mean, all sorts of variations of the truth. But I can say I've never slept with a single woman, and that's the truth. So, by telling a half-truth like that, I am telling the truth, and you can't accuse me of not telling the truth. It's just that it's not the whole picture. It's not the totally ethical, it's not responsible, it's not honourable and trustworthy. Now I do say and I do emphasise and re-emphasise that that was merely an example. All right. It's very a very diplomatic example. Well I could have turned it around, couldn't I? I could have said, Ilza may say that she's, but that would be, that would be unfair and, and, uh, and I couldn't comment on whether it was true or not. Uh, but it would, be, it would be embarrassing for me to, to have depersonalized it and made it personal for you. But yes, diplomatically, I think you're right. I'm diplomatic. But I do deny it. No, it's this way. Oh, I see. You mean it's your government? Uh, also, yes. <laughs> your parliamentarians, yeah, your parliamentarians and your newspapers and the media. Yeah, they are, they are skilled organizations in telling the truth but not the whole truth. Yes, diplomacy. Also, it also requires a willingness to apply the spirit as well as the letter of the law. Once you've got the guideline, it now comes down to individuals. It comes down to an individual as to how they should apply this principle. Uh, and it, it's the individual personal ethics of the people whose responsibility it is. We can attract new investment into entities, particularly in developing nations, in some of the... Um, Far East and some of the African nations particularly, uh, if it is suggested, if it were suggested that the government were corrupt, that the people in the heads of organizations were corrupt, then who from the, and I use the term loosely, who from the Western world is going to invest money into one of these developing nations where they cannot trust the integrity of the people with whom they're investing their money. Uh, your money is at risk. Even charities, even some of our big charities in the UK, who raise millions and millions of pounds in order to help relieve poverty and famine and drought in depressed nations. Even then I heard on the radio the, the other day, that around 80% of the money that was raised never actually reached the people that it was intended to reach. So here I am paying my charitable contributions and every pound I pay, only 20 pence of that actually is used to relieve poverty or relieve drought or hardship. So it then makes me even more cynical and you then think to, I think to myself, why should I want to pay my money 
in order that 80% of that money is going to line the pockets of corrupt officials. I could look at it a different way and say, I accept that 80% of my gift is used to line the pockets of corrupt individuals, but at least 20% of it is getting to the right place. So it depends which way, you, which slant you put onto it. Would you happily give would you happily give ten dollars to relieve somebody's poverty, knowing that only two of those ten dollars is actually going to, to help to relieve hardship? Or would you rather think, why should I pay eight dollars to my parliamentarians? There is a country in Eastern Europe which is recently uh, about nineteen uh, two thousand and five, I think, joined the European Community, um, where the president, the race for the president, was a toss up between uh, a doctor who was accused of accepting, um, I'll use the word gifts, but I think the word I heard was bribes, uh, and a person who was a known uh, corrupt official. So your president, the, the president of this particular country that I'm thinking of, um, is, is the lesser of two evils apparently. How did you vote in your recent election? Did you vote for the Green Party? Why not? Why not? If the Green Party is there protecting the planet, why did you not vote for the Green Party? Possibly because they allegedly may be just as corrupt as all the other parties. Possibly. Allegedly. I'm not going to say that they are. So we can attract new investment into companies, particularly in developing nations. There should be accountability to shareholders and other stakeholders and everyone therefore. Companies should be accountable. And it underpins market confidence, capital market confidence in companies, government, regulations, regulatory authorities and the tax authorities.